could be due to hyperplasia or adenoma. No? Either of the two. Both would be presenting almost similarly, barring only one finding that is you will find an adenoma and in others you will find a little bit of hyperplasia in all parameters. In hyperplasia, we carry out what is called a three and a half parathyroidectomy, which means we'll remove all four and auto implant one in the forearm. So that's a very, very clear distinction. With parathyroid adenoma, the concept is that it is a dominant adenoma. Others automatically become recessive. So we need to remove just one adenoma. In the past, we used to remove the, the ipsilateral superior parathyroid in this case, or depending upon which one is not. Okay. But that is no longer practiced. We just will remove the adenoma. We'll send the parathormone serum pit from the IJV. As soon as we remove it, if the levels drop, we'll find immediate report of the PTH has a very short half. The moment we remove the adenoma, the other glands that are used to not working, it's like out of four of you, one of you is the dominant worker, the other starts sleeping. When I take away the dominant worker, the others take a little while to start working. So there is something called as hungry bone syndrome. Because presently her circulation has, you know, she's got more calcium and there is a deposition. But this calcium has been taken away from where? From the bones. So there is a limited supply. But the moment you remove it, the bones start want to claim their calcium back. So there will be a transient high pore calcium. And that's where the management starts. We know our I mean our since it's an endocrine unit. We work with the medical endocrinologist very closely. We monitor this phase. Once this phase is over, she requires nothing. Right inferior parathyroid adenoma in this case. That's all. Okay. Earlier, the removal of the other gland was to just make sure that we have a parathyroid and another one. But this is not practiced anymore. For hyperplasia, we have three and a half parathyroidectomy, so there is a clear distinction between the two. These are the biggest Yeah, five years. These are postgraduate, she's my registrar. Two postgraduates have gone out to see the patient. So it goes on. What was I saying? See, why is there polyurea and diabetes? Sugar is to be washed out. So along with the sugar, water goes. Along with the calcium, the water goes. So polyurea is our body's defense mechanism to get rid of that extra calcium. It doesn't succeed because a lot of it is GI related. So calcium has got multiple reasons. No? So that is one. The other thing is the possibility of for carcinoma. First is in the history then on examination and then on investigations. In history, there will be a rapidly growing visible swelling in the neck. And in adenoma, it's not usually a palpable adenoma. Why? Because parathyroid lies behind the thyroid. It's an extra capsular structure. It's not within the thyroid. Very rarely you find it so large. But if it is large, suspected to be cancer. Number two, serum calcium levels are four to five folds. They will be in the tune of 25, 30. In adenoma, they just marginally rise. It is more symptomatic than, I mean, it does, the symptoms don't, I mean, uh, correlate with the serum calcium level. Okay. The third is, you will have of course, I mentioned about the palpable swelling, palpable cervical nodes, usually level 6. 
All these features put together will raise the suspicion, but the screening test is serum calcium. PTH would rise three to four times. Calcium would rise three to four times. All these factors put together raise the suspicion of carcinoma. So now a million dollar question, if there is a palpable swelling, like I can do an ultrasound guide in anything because ultrasound is the gold standard for localizing and doing an FNA. System B is a gold standard for localizing an adenome. But localizing thyroid, parathyroid or any lymph node in the neck, the gold standard is ultrasound. Even in parathyroid adenoma, ultrasound has a sensitivity of 80%. So, suppose I can localize it, why don't I do an FNAC? That's what is the usual question. FNAC would disrupt the capsule, so we don't disturb it. So, do we do an FNAC in that case? No, we go with an evidence of, uh, you know, history and examination as I've shown you. Clear? And on system B scan also, the pickup would be so huge, like you have in a PET scan for a cancer, there you have SUV, here you have the reading of, uh, you know, the, the scan. It will be very, very strong. And then, importantly, there will be lymph nodes, which will also pick up, which will also pick up the tracer. So, therefore, entire thing put together, if it was a carcinoma, our treatment is total inferior parathyroidectomy. And in this case, I will remove the superior parathyroid to make sure that the disease-free, I mean, a, the gland is disease-free. And also to make sure that you, what you have removed is parathyroid, because you can, then it doesn't remain like a parathyroid gland, so you can't really call it parathyroid by gross look. One. Number two, I'll do, as you saw me doing in the last case, I did hemithyroidectomy along. And then strap muscles, I'll remove. And level six, Prophylactic central on the section. This is all in cancer. In this case, I'll just remove the adenoma. That's the answer to that question.